or visit marijuanaissafer.com. It's time for the Russ Belleville Show's Cannabis Q&A with Dr. Mitch Earlywine. Dr. Earlywine is a professor of psychology at the State University of New York at Albany and a leading author and researcher on cannabinoids and health who pins the Ask Dr. Mitch column for High Times Magazine. Get your questions ready in our live chat or call in to 971-533-7111 now. All right, welcome back, everybody. 32 after the hour. It's time for our cannabis Q&A with Dr. Mitch. But uh, the number I'm dialing out to him with uh, is busy at the moment. I'm not exactly sure what's going on with that at the moment. So we will uh, play a little bit of music. And when we come back, hopefully we'll have Dr. Mitch on the line. Stick around. This is Willie Nelson with the Hesitation Blues. up this morning looking for my shoes look behind the trunk found the hesitation blues lordy tell me how long lordy tell me how long will i have to wait will i have to wait can i get you now can i get you now must i hesitate Blues overtake me, rock away from here. Oh, Lordy, tell me how long. Lordy, tell me how long. Will I have to wait? Will I have to wait? Can I get you now? Can I get you now? Must I hesitate? All right, welcome back, everybody. I think we've got Dr. Mitch on the line. Are you there? Indeed, I am. Oh, fantastic. Great to have you back here. We've had a few weeks off between the uh, federal holidays and the flights, but it's great to talk to you again. I uh, want to remind everybody we're taking your questions in our live chat room, so uh, get those ready for us as we discuss the first couple of topics. Or if you like the old-fashioned way, you can just call in live at 971 971- Five three three seventy one eleven. We always open up by giving Dr. Mitch the first word in the latest in cannabis science. So, what's new, Doc? So, in fact, uh, the guy who discovered the uh, THC receptor, uh, the CB1 at least, uh, Raphael Mahulam, the guy from Israel, just put a paper out suggesting that, in fact, cannabidiol looks like it really can help uh, sort of protect folks against some of the memory impairing effects of THC. But he wanted to emphasize that at least in the animal literature, it doesn't protect against every single possible uh, deficit in working memory. But again, those are during uh, intoxication or basically right after THC administration. We still don't see any meaningful impairments in chronic users when they haven't used recently. Okay, okay, that's good. And uh, I know the last we had spoken, you were working on a few papers or studies uh, trying to get the uh, approval on those. Any uh, movement on those? So we, we definitely are uh, gathering data slowly but surely on the cannabis and menopause, and I'm really grateful for everyone who's been participating. And if you're willing to pass that along to anybody who might be that age and gender, I'm certainly, certainly grateful. And I'm afraid the first dabs paper got bounced by the first journal we sent it to, but I'm optimistic we can uh, kind of tighten things up and send it off to another journal. All right. So you mentioned the uh, the cannabidiol and Dr. McCullum and his work with, uh, you know, these various compounds. And, and this is getting a lot of play lately. CBD, cannabidiol, uh, specifically from the Sanjay Gupta documentary where they show cannabis oil helping these girl, this little girl with Dervais syndrome, you know, basically almost cure her epilepsy. Now we've got people in Utah trying to get it. Uh, the state senator in Pennsylvania just dropped a medical marijuana bill that would legalize only the high CBD plants and high CBD oil. What's your take on on this these this recent these recent developments with CBD and how do they how do they uh, uh, how might they affect our push for medical marijuana in general? I'm always delighted when anybody can find something that helps uh, any of their disorders, but epilepsy in particular. The medications that are available for those can be very sedating for some folks, and even if they do prevent uh, seizure, they can kind of make you a zombie. Some of them don't work for some people. And we've had data uh, since the 80s suggesting cannabidiol might be helpful. 
this is in a uh, kind of quasi gray area legally. Uh, you can get CBD sort of sent to you from uh, a, a company outside your state, but it's it's just not uh, something that uh, people have basically faced law enforcement about just yet. I like this idea because I think it points out that the cannabis plant is a source of some wonderful medicine of all types. If this is the type that folks are comfortable with first, by all means, let's let's push the high CBD stuff for now until folks are, are ready for strains that also have THC. But I think it does have a bit of ironic um, paradox, if you will, that we're happy to take one cannabinoid and not another is, is a little curious. <laughs> the, uh, the story I was uh, going over, and in fact, I mentioned it in uh, behind the headlines, was uh, in Utah, they're calling it Alepsia, which I found ironic that they're, they're having to change the name of medical marijuana to Alepsia so that it, you know, allays people's fears about marijuana when marijuana was the u- word we used in the first place to distract people from the fact that it was medical. <laughs> we've, we've gone full circle now. You know, what's crazy is the first time somebody used the term concentration camp, it was a euphemism for death camp. And now <laughs> we say that when we mean death camp. So it's, it's just hilarious how we can come up with these euphemisms. Yeah, absolutely. Now, this, uh, this high CBD oil, um, the theory they're floating in Utah is that it's just like hemp seed oil that you would get at a Whole Foods. It's so low in THC that it could qualify for intra- interstate you know, shipments and it wouldn't be illegal under Utah law. But does the federal government ban CBD itself, the molecule, or is it just when it's within cannabis plants? So right now, CBD is not a, a Schedule drug. So it's not Schedule 1 and it's not even Schedule 5. It's just not on the radar. <laughs> um, there are, like, eBay sites that will send you CBD gum and things like that if, if you're willing to pay the price. I'm not sure how long that's going to last. And given some of the things that the feds have done recently with Silk Road and things like that, I'm uh, never going to underestimate those guys. Yeah, not even on the schedule. So THC in any form, whether it's in the plant or synthesized or whatever in all its you know various uh, uh incarnations that we find on k2 and spice all those are illegal but cbd's not even on the schedule well and what's crazy is so uh tac is marinol is one schedule that's less uh illegal <laughs> to own than, than thc the marijuana natural plant and then all those spice things really aren't like thc they're not partial agonists uh, to the CB1 receptor. They're usually direct agonists, and, I mean, they're available for animal research, but uh, really not good for human consumption, and they're uh, yet a different schedule. It's it's, it's kind of nutty. Hmm. We've got a question from our chat room about this, uh, wondering that CBD without THC, are there other conditions where the two in concert are better than just CBD by itself? As it turns out, some of the work with uh, MS patients uh, not only with pain but also with muscle spasm, suggests that there's at least a subset of folks who respond better to the combination. Um, cannabidiol itself really isn't psychoactive. So if it uh, does create a mildly relaxing effect, but it's great for uh, some of the insomnia and things like that that we see by itself, but with THC, it's super good as far as as far as the insomnia and sleep literature is concerned as well. Hmm. I worry with this focus on CBD lately and it being non-impairing, they keep emphasizing it's non-psychoactive, that we might end up where CBD is considered to be medical marijuana and THC is considered something that just gets you high. If that's the case, what can we tell people about THC by itself and its medical utility? Well, as it turns out, most of the... Uh, legendary appetite enhancing effects are really THC and not CBD at all. Um, I have uh, gotten reports from folks who say CBD actually decreases their appetite, which, I mean, there aren't any published data on that, but I can't imagine anybody would make that up. Mm -hmm. And so uh, clearly for the appetite enhancement associated with age-related wasting and uh, cancer chemotherapy and things like that, we definitely need THC in that armament because the other drugs uh, that are available for enhancing appetite are just uh, relatively ineffective and absurdly expensive in comparison. Mm. All right. Uh, Another story that I I haven't gotten to yet, but I'm going to cover it in an hour or two, uh, deals with this FDA approval of a new opioid called Zohydro, which is 10 times, apparently 10 times more hydrocodone than Vicodin. And the FDA's own board voted 11 to 2 against approving this stuff, but it got approved anyway. 
what do you think will be the outcome of the approval of this new Super Vicodin? And what does that show as far as money talks in the approval process? I, I was disheartened by this, but in, in truth, I, I feel like uh, this is this is what we're up against with the free market. So the fact that you can vote 11 to 2 and still end up with a, a drug on the market makes me wonder, well, what is what is the point of having the vote? If the, if the uh, big pharma basically can put anything out they want, now we have to really rely on individual consumers to be educated in that sense. So if a physician uh, writes you a script for something and you realize, hey, I heard this was dangerous, it's okay to ask for Vicodin instead. And with a lot of pain, I'd much rather have aspirin and cannabis. Mm. You know, uh, another aspect of this story has to deal with the double dipping by the company that makes not only this drug, but a prescription version of naltrexone to treat opiate addiction, which seems to me about the same ethical level as a cigarette company selling a stop smoking patch. I mean, how, how, what are the ethics involved in these kind of situations where you sell the drug and you sell the drug that treats the addiction to that drug? I mean, the, the irony is with some of the tobacco companies, too, they also sell those nicotine gums and patches mm -hmm. and things like that. At least they're superordinate company that owns them both. And I find this just ethically reprehensible. This is just completely creepy on all grounds. And in, in a sense, it's uh, making addicts for money. I, I, just, I just hate the thought of that. But I don't want to interfere with the market in some ways because I'd much rather people just make educated decisions. But we really got to get the word out that uh, just because you're in pain doesn't need, mean you need an opiate. Yeah. Okay. And uh, just to wrap things up here, I, I had an article that I had – gotten published up in High Times Magazine uh, uh, online today where I asked or, or I theorized uh, as to what the final states, who the final states would be that would legalize marijuana. Because everywhere I go, you know, I go to Texas, they say, oh, Texas will be the last to legalize. I go to Florida, they say, oh, Florida, oh, we'll be the last to legalize. Do you have any uh, uh, bets in this, uh, in this pool, Dr. Mitch? What's funny is uh, you have to think about the demographics, so it's not going to be parallel to uh, alcohol necessarily. Uh, Mississippi was one of the last states to uh, basically let alcohol be sold, and there are still many dry counties there, but I feel like Mississippi is also a place where cannabis could grow uh, wild and easily, so we, we can't necessarily go on those. If I had to pick, uh, I just I, I would hate to jinx <laughs> I would hate to jinx a particular state. And so I'm, I'm uh, cautiously superstitious about such a thing. Okay, <laughs> we, will, we won't jinx it. Just to let you, just to let the cat out of the bag, I picked my own home state of Idaho, but maybe I'm just a little biased. I figure, I figure when the legislature votes 29 to five that marijuana shall never be legal for any reason, even medical. That's a pretty good warning shot. I got to admit, those are some compelling data. <laughs> okay. Folks, uh, if you want to get your question into Dr. Mitch early on, you can do so through 420 Radio's contact page. we got a drop-down list there. You can pick Ask Dr. Mitch, or you can send your emails directly to 420research at gmail.com. And oftentimes, your questions become the spark for a new study or a new survey. And again, Dr. Mitch, if people want to get involved with your current surveys, uh, can you give them some uh, contact info? Uh, essentially, if they can email me at 420research at gmail.com, that's 420research at gmail.com, I'm happy to send them the appropriate link. Oh, all right, there we go. So just do that, folks. We'll get you all linked up and uh, get this data collected. Thanks, Dr. Mitch, for joining us here, and we'll talk to you next week. Looking forward to it. All right, folks, when we come back, time for a radical rant. That high CBD oil, that Alepsia stuff, is it the next step into the box canyon of medical marijuana? We'll talk about that when we come back. We'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belleville Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show. The voice of the marijuana nation. Just fuck, 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 fu